Alliance for Astronautics. And I want to, before we get into tonight's program, as usual, I'd like to remind you of a couple of uh, things that are coming up in the, uh, in the next couple of months. The final presentation of our lecture series uh, will be a week from tonight. And uh, after about five years of trying to juggle schedules and get our schedule and her schedule to fit, we've uh, finally managed to uh, work it out for Dr. Sally Ride, America's first woman in space, to join us as part of our uh, lecture series. So she'll be here. Uh, as you may have heard, she's very big into supporting uh, the interest that young girls, especially middle school age, have in mathematics and sciences and encouraging them to continue that interest into a career in uh, the technological areas, math, science, whatever. And she'll be speaking on that side of what she does as well as her experiences with NASA and as part of the uh, Challenger and Columbia accident investigation. <coughs> on December the 5th, Sunday morning, December the 5th, if you liked our Fighter Aces Symposium last year, we're going to do something very similar. Wings of Valor, Medal of Honor Aviators, Sunday morning on the 5th, we'll bring together five pilots that have been awarded the Medal of Honor while flying in combat in Vietnam, Korea, World War II, and these five men represent the Army, Air Force, the Navy, and Marines. So it's a broad spectrum. The symposium is going to be moderated by Mr. Barrett Tillman, who has been a lecturer for this lecture series and also is a highly regarded military historian and author. So we hope you'd like to come out and join us for that. On the 17th of December, as you will see when you get your newsletters in the next couple of days, we're going to have a celebration of flight. Last year's uh, centennial of flight uh, celebration on the 17th, the 100th anniversary of the first powered flight was a real rip-roaring success. We decided we didn't need to wait and um, celebrate the Wright brothers' first flight every 100 years. We could probably do it once a year and that would be kind of a neat thing. So as with last year, some of us will try to uh, make you believe that some of the stories we're telling about the experiences and the airplanes you're seeing are true. And uh, we'll have some uh, family activities. So if you want to bring your youngsters, there'll be plenty for them to do. Thanks to the education department. We'll uh, also have our volunteers operating their reproduction 1903 Wright Flyer engine. If you'd like to hear how little confidence you gain by listening to this engine. <laughs> um, and also, a real treat, we're going to introduce, for the first time, our own Wright Flyer Simulator. If you were here and had a chance last November, when the Microsoft Wright Flyer Simulator was making a tour and it stopped off here for about six days, if you had a chance to do that and embarrass yourself, as to how much you didn't know about adverse y'all, you'll have a chance to do that all over again because mm -hmm. we've recreated one and we'll uh, roll that out uh, to the public for the first time on December the 17th. So I invite you to join us for that. Um, next spring's lecture series, our 28th Aerospace Lecture Series, will be entitled Aviation Mysteries. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> um, before we go any further, I want to thank a couple of people again. Mr. Jerry Williams for uh, videotaping this uh, lecture series. Uh, we really appreciate that, so we'll have copies for our archives. Also, I'd like to uh, give a real uh, round of uh, congratulations and thanks to Amelia Chapman, our Director of Education, and her crew who put together this uh, lecture series. And Amelia, thank you very much. Um, we, have, uh, we have some members of our Board of Directors here tonight. Our chairman, Toby Fuller, back there in the back. Uh, seats waiting to hear what was going to happen next with Alan Shepard, uh, John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, and <coughs> Jim Lovell, and Frank Borman, and so forth, and Wally Shaw, and all of them. Um, 
And Walter Cronkite would be explaining to us that the, what the crew was doing at, at this particular moment, getting ready for the next uh, event in the mission profile. Or Jules Bergman over on ABC would be explaining in detail how a rendezvous and docking maneuver was going. And, and my mother was yelling at the TV screen, why don't you tell us how they go to the bathroom? Nobody ever talks about how they go to the bathroom. I want to know how they go to the bathroom. <laughs> Unfortunately, Mom can't be here tonight, and that's too bad, because our guest speaker tonight uh, worked on developing life support technology for all the major programs from Apollo to the International Space Station, including the Lunar Excursion Module, uh, the Skylab, and the uh, Space Shuttle Extravehicular Maneuvering Unit. It's a big pack that they Actually, they don't really strap it on. They kind of back into it and, and, and they move around with it outside. Um, he also uh, worked uh, extensively on regenerative life support systems for uh, Mars missions in the future, which are going to be a long haul project. And so that part of the operation becomes, as it always is, every bit as important as how you even get there in the first place. He's also been involved in the evaluation of Russian life support systems. He's now retired from Hamilton Sunstrand and working uh, an interesting project pres through the preservation, for the preservation of uh, unique equipment through a heritage hardware program, which I'm sure he'll mention. <coughs> in his alter ego is Dr. Flush. This man <laughs> gives children's programs on life support systems, as he will be, be doing this coming Saturday. So if you want to bring your youngsters from 11 to 4 in our space flight gallery, uh, he'll be doing that. And if you watch real closely tonight, you may see a brief appearance by Dr. Flush. But for right now, I'd like to present in his own persona, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Donald Wesley. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bruce. And basically, I'm glad to be here to talk about the fun stuff of space, okay? And uh, we're really, I want you to have fun tonight, okay? Because I had fun in a 40-year career keeping astronauts alive in space. And just like pilots, you are up there flying, got nothing between you and your, and the ground between a nice wing and a motor. We, and in space, you got to have a life support system also that keeps you alive. And so that's what I'll talk about quite a bit. Uh, I'll be kind of going back and forth. So if you want to interject a question, I can go many different ways tonight, okay? And um, also uh, what I'm going to do is kind of start off by maybe talking about what the real plan is now. This is going to be an overview of maybe what uh, the government and NASA is trying to do for the future. But it'll be about a two-second scenario. Let's let you know where we're going to go. Because we got right now technology sitting on the shelf collecting dust to live on Mars. Also could help in global warming problems at, in the world on the Earth right here. We tr what we do in space, we got to bring back to Earth. Because the longer you live in space, the more you recycle like Mother Earth. It's taking your carbon dioxide from your breath, taking your, uh, we've been reclaiming urine. At Hamilton Standard, I'll go back and forth between these two things, but Hamilton Sunshine says 1965, reclaiming urine back to drinkable water. Now, if you think about that, you know, somewhere in this bottle of water right here, that I just took a drink, your molecule of water is in there. About three years ago, you donated it, okay? <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Uh, let, your, let, let your mind wander tonight while I talk to I want you to kind of think, think out of the box. How would you design something? How would you, like, make, uh, how would you make drip coffee in space when nothing drips? Okay? And, and, and I'm an engineer. I'm a nuts and bolts engineer. I'm going to present this talk tonight from, from the engineering point of view. We've got to make things work. We've got to do it safely. Okay? So, and, and here we are. I love to fly in space. I'm not an astronaut, but I just have a, a, the unique opportunity to build things for astronauts to keep them alive in space. We consider this very important. Even the toilet, just as important as building a spacesuit, you know, for us. But yet, Dr. Flush came about as putting a little humor, a little humor in something that's very specific. Plus, also being from Wisconsin, and, you know, I grew up on a farm out there. We got more uh, meth uh, state gas in Wisconsin is methane. <laughs> Anyway, I can handle the right stuff. So they put me on a job about, about maybe in 1990, 89, uh, to develop a commode for the space station. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. And what I'm going to do tonight, 
is try to go more into the fun side of it. Uh, probably uh, Saturday I'll talk about general stuff in space, but, but I want to talk about some history. And since you all want to know about how you go to the bathroom in space, we'll go through the, the evolution of this, okay? But I want to go first into a little bit of the general's aspect. This is Dr. Flush, and there is some technical truth to that, because the methane is what may get you back from Mars. One of the big issues they have was when you, if you go to Mars, you have to take all the fuel with you. Not necessarily. There's carbon dioxide on Mars. And we can take that and make it into, make it into a, a fuel and some other products. We can maybe live off the land, so to speak. And that's one of the aspects of how we're going to do it. If I get in time, I'll talk about the future. But let's talk about the past. Or uh, I'm jumping around here. Well, let's go first. I'm going to give you about two seconds of a broad plan. And to make sure I stay on the level, this is a Home Depot pointer. You see that? Oh, okay, it works. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is basically the new vision for space exploration. You may have heard this. This is kind of like the, what they're going to do uh, on a broad plan. Um, uh, uh, Sean O'Keefe uh, basically is kind of like said we're going to, we can't do everything like we did the Apollo program. The Apollo program, we had roughly 400,000 people working on getting these guys to space and to the moon and back. I never thought we were, being an engineer in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, you know, down the dredges of doing that stuff, I never realized we were in a space race at that time. I was a young guy from Wisconsin, okay, doing my job. I had a chance just three weeks before we landed on the moon to go up on top of the Saturn rocket. This is the, the Apollo 11. It was up there, already stacked up, all ready to go. I had a corrected deficiency in our hardware. As a young engineer, I was shaking in my boots. Went up to 350 feet up to the, uh, to the second landing, which is the lunar module. Went in there, all my, all my tools were tethered to my wrist, okay? And I said, she was, uh, hmm. I had to repair some problem. And we had five people inside the lunar module. There was an inspector on my, the lunar module was designed for two people. I had an inspector on my back, I'm sure, to make sure I did my job right. But I still didn't have believed that we were going to the moon. As I say, I grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. Remember the phrase, you may have heard it out here in California. When I was a young guy, I said, if I, if I couldn't jump that ditch or lift that bale of hay, I'd say to my buddy, that's impossible. That is like going to the moon. Ever hear that? Way back when, okay? Three weeks before we went to the moon, this machine is going to go to the moon. Okay, the day they land on the moon, that phrase went away. Okay, same thing. I went to the University of Wisconsin. Okay, we as a mechanical engineer, we studied steam engines. Psst, 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 you know the old 12-foot diameter steam engines. Here I am talking about nanotechnology, possibly. Okay, that, all those kind of those things really. I've gone in my lifetime. In fact, I grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. A little another little story here. We did not have indoor plumbing. You couldn't get copper or at that time. You went to the war effort, right? So we had the little outhouse next to the barn. In my lifetime, I'm gone from the out the thunder mug. Remember, what, you know what a thunder mug is? That's a that's a nice name for the chamber pot underneath the bed. <laughs> the thunder mug. Okay, we had that in the winter time under the bed. And that next to the barn, we had the outhouse. I've gone from the outhouse to the cosmic commode in my lifetime. <laughs> okay, now John Crapper can't even say. I celebrated John Crapper's 100th uh, anniversary of whatever he did. Anyway, what we're doing now is the next step I want to see is, uh, is to return the shuttle to flight. I hope I'm in focus here. Okay, return the shuttle to flight. Obviously, I got some hardware up here on the shuttle, but basically that morning, last about a year and a half ago, I was, giving a talk, I was going to give a talk at 10 o'clock to the University of Hartford, 400 people at the University of Hartford. At 9 o'clock in the morning, the shuttle Columbia came in as a meteorite. Okay? All I'm trying to say is that we, we talk about these things, we look at them, about these, these problems in engineering, these, these things in space. But we do our job. We do a lot of homework to make it, make it work right. I'll talk about a few of the problems. But the kids at that, at that meeting, let's keep going. I turned it into a town, kind of like town meeting, rather than a discussion like I'm, I would normally do on a technical basis. The kids want to keep going. 
We survived. We worked through the Apollo 1 problem. We worked through the Apollo 13. Personally, we helped out, and I'll talk about that. We worked on the, uh, on the uh, Challenger issue. We worked on that. And then we worked on the, of uh, course, with Columbia was the last problem we had. Let me put it this way. Every time that shuttle flies, if you know about hardware, obviously, we do our homework. Like if we built, an, uh, we ha I was a lead engineer a long time ago for the, the cooler for an APU. You are all aircraft guys. You know what an APU is? Auxiliary power unit? You cool, you know, wait, how do you cool an APU? Ram air? In space, is there ram air? We have a boiler. We've got to boil water in space. I'll talk about that later. There's another whole issue. It's a very complicated 100, 140,000 BTUs an hour boiler. Okay, that's a very complicated system. So when we build a system and certify it for NASA, just like you kind of do on aircraft stuff, you know, that we use the same kind of technology the, aeros the aircraft industry does for certifying equipment. But basically, we have to go through that equipment and identify all the possible failures. What's a failure on your car? Flat tire, okay? That's one failure, one identified failure. What's the corrective action? Change the tire, right? Call AAA, maybe out here, I don't know. Anyway, so we have gone through, we've got a book about yay thick, like a telephone book, for every piece of equipment. We send that to NASA as part of our contract. NASA takes all these books, adds them all up. Every time that shuttle flies, there are roughly 3 million identified failures and corrective actions. Ah, that's why I'm still an engineer. <laughs> but based now, have we identified all the failures? Obviously, we have missed a couple. There is a couple of failures that we really worry about. If one of those booster rockets does not light off, there's no escape. Okay? So there are still some identified on some problems. Okay, that's... So therefore, we have to correct, get the shuttle back into its proper operating. Right now, what they're doing at Hamilton, we are the prime contractor for the spacesuit at Hamilton Standard Sunstrand in Connecticut. We built the spacesuit. So right now, we are working with NASA to come up with a way to go out around the shuttle. Fly. We never, we never allow the astronauts to go around the back of the shuttle. On the, on the, on the, on the uh, this is the one of the one of the 24,000 tiles glued to the shuttle. If the astronaut missed or hit this. You could damage this. They would worry about it because you're in space. And if you damage this, you could possibly have a problem. Well, these, you can damage this a little bit. What they want to do now, though, is if you have a major problem like the shuttle did on the uh, Columbia, they want to go out with some ablative material. This material will survive shuttle after shuttle mission. The Apollo capsule you got out there is ablative. You can only use once. So they want to take some goop with us on the back of the backpack, fly out and bow around the shuttle, and come up with a corrective action okay, the corrective mode for that failure, to put stuff some pu silly putty, some unknown, unknown compound, put it in there and become now a blade of material. So all I'm trying to say on the, Colum on the Challenger, when we lost the Challenger, a little situation, that capsule, that pressurized top little pin area of this capsule is a pressurized part of the shuttle. When that 55 billion horsepower blew up, that capsule was blown free of the explosion. Two of the astronauts changed over to manual oxygen. We have evidence of the valve when they on the, on the uh, they took, got all the hardware later. They fished it out of the ocean. Two of those valves were changed over to manual oxygen. At that time, they were flying with basically a hood, like a like a pilot would, for oxygen over their face. So if you had a failure, you can turn it on. Okay, all seven astronauts. Basically, the, the that capsule was blown free of the capsule of the uh, explosion, and was like trailing the pipes and wires became aerodynamically stable. It went up to 65,000 feet and was coming back down two and a half minutes later. All seven astronauts died of blunt trauma when it hit the water. Okay? So therefore, what they did is they gave uh, David Clark, another company in, 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 uh, in uh, Massachusetts, built uh, the orange pumpkin suits. They walk out the shuttle now. They always walk out in these little orange suits. They now, this suit is an automatic oxygen pressurization suit. If they lose cabin pressure, it'll automatically inflate. It's got a parachute in it, survival gear, and they possibly could bail out. So all I'm trying to say is NASA has gone the extra mile. When you fly an airplane, do you get a parachute? Oh, well, that's maybe so. You'd like to have one, maybe. The astronauts, possibly they could bail out in, in a certain window of altitude. Okay, return to flight. Okay, next, next step is... We want to basically complete the space station. 
So that's uh, the space station, of course, right now is the International Space Station. And of course, it's in the process of being developed. We'll need roughly about 20 more shuttle flights to take the cargo up. The shuttle, to me, is an 18-wheeler in space. Takes up 20,000 pounds, brings back if it wants to. So basically, we still need the shuttle to do that job, so we've got to complete the space station. We have some international commitments on that. OK, and of course, the, for the Dreamers, uh, we want to be able to come up with a new design. Whoops, hand is quick on the eye. Of the um, of the space station or the sh or the shuttle, something that could go beyond maybe what the shuttle. The shuttle cannot go to the moon. The shuttle is only designed the specs that we wrote. We were out. I was stationed out in uh, Rockwell, out in Downey, California, for about three or four months, running specs for the shuttle. The shuttle can only stay in space for basically 17 days. Now you get into the into the Columbia mode. Some astronauts will say they could have maybe went into a uh, uh, into a lifeboat mode, just like we did on this, on this shot. I'll talk about the Apollo 13 later. Uh, anyway, this is a new system maybe to go beyond to explore in space. But the shuttle can't, can't go to the moon, does not have enough energy, or can't stay up there long enough. Then they want to do is go return to the moon. Okay, that's uh, kind of the next uh, phase uh, beyond this. Now, there's no timeline to this. There's basically no real major increase in the NASA budget. Basically, the NASA budget right now, if you can, if you can pull up all the prices of how much uh, pe the United States spends on female lingerie, it's about the same budget. Put it in perspective, okay? Anyway, uh, that's return to the moon. Uh, I got some issues of how long it would take to get back to the moon. In 1958, Remember, there. This is a year after the Sputnik. They were they were blowing up Vanguard missiles on the Cape. The Navy couldn't get this missile off the ground and half a hundred feet and come down. The Atlas missile. They're all having problems, right? In 11 years, we were on the moon. 1969. If we were to go back today, if we had the same, maybe this. I don't know if we have the same discipline or over the same, but I think it would take about 20 years. I'll tell you some reasons later. Okay, and then we get into uh, to Mars and beyond. Okay, now, uh, you're how, how old are you now? What's your name? Blaine. Blaine? Yes. And about maybe when you get about, about 30, 40 years old, you may be able to help on something like this, okay? It's going to be a long time. I won't see it. You may see it. However, right now, at Hamilton Sunstrand, we are building, a spa we are building concept spacesuits to walk on Mars. We've been to the, uh, the Devon Island scenario. Uh, we've been doing some life support systems, to, again, to keep people alive. Uh, in uh, using uh, life support systems. So that's a rough idea of what the, the general uh, plans are in the future. Any thoughts, projects? Anybody want to go? Robots? We're going to use robots. There's an issue, too. Some people say you can't go to Mars without robots. Well, yes, uh, right now we've got robots up there. They're great. We need robots. And they're, yes? Well, okay. Um, ah. <laughs> okay. A real quick one on this one. Um, let me put a say that we are, we are become a nation of safety issues. In 1960, I didn't have a seatbelt in my car or truck. I still drive an 85 pickup truck, okay? No car, no, you know, carburetor and all that. But anyway, right now, you got to put your kids in a, and grandkids in a seat and a seatbelt and all that kind of stuff. Safety issues. Okay, what I'm trying to say by that is in the Apollo program, all the Apollo capsules, the ones out, you got out in front here. All the lunar modules, those systems there, were all designed for 100% pure oxygen. Okay? 100% pure oxygen. Along comes Apollo 1. They were doing a test on the ground down there, and we were designing the lunar module at that time. 5 PSIA, 5 pounds per square inch, about one third of roughly atmosphere, no nitrogen, 100% oxygen. There was a spark in the cabin. In 20 seconds, three astronauts were toast. Chafee, White, and Grissom were gone. Okay? We survived the entire Apollo program on five PSIA inside all those cabins. Every time they flew to the moon, we were worried about it. Okay, now what we did is we actually, if you look at this hardware over here, uh, all of our wires are Teflon coated and all that kind of stuff. So we went through extraordinary means to make sure we not have a, a fire. Every piece of equipment inside the lunar module, every piece of equipment inside the, lunar, uh, the command module had to be identified as to whether it would burn or not, or outgas. We found out there was too much plastic, if you want to call it, inside the command module. 
So that's one. So we'd have to get rid of we. What they did now is in the in the uh, the new spacecraft. All these pressurized vessels now are 14.7 one atmosphere pounds per square inch of nitrogen and oxygen to proper ratio. So now they are safe. Okay, so to go to the moon, there was a weight weight issue, a real weight issue. We went through a lot of programs to eliminate the weight problem. So if we were to go to a higher pressure cabin to survive the 14.7 p, we have three times the weight, a weight problem. Okay, we've got to solve that problem. Safety inside the lunar module. Well, we, I don't have a lunar module here, but basically the cooling system was antifreeze. Okay, it was antifreeze toxic. Okay, we inside the cabin, zero, zero gravity, we had a 60-40 we had mixture of uh, antifreeze and water, you know, of, uh, of antifreeze and water. Anyway, if that leaked in the cabin, you would have a problem. So now we've got to solve that problem. We can't have that anymore. And furthermore, maybe OSHA would step in. The moon is too dusty. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is we have to solve some new problems and make it even safer. And that would be, again, pushing the technology. Yes. Now, I don't know if that answered your question, but good question. Okay? Okay, let's go into some fun stuff here now, okay? Um, well, going back to the lunar module, what do we have in front of you here is I'll show you some. I have, this is the Apollo life support system. We got the contract for, from NASA to build this, this little portable life support system, which is basically like a knapsack on the back of the, of the old spacesuits. Uh, the old space is, I'll just put a picture up here to kind of put it in perspective. In fact, there is a picture over there which you, uh, the museum donated to me uh, to put out in front of you. But uh, who knows, here we go. We'll just put one up like this. This spacesuit here was basically designed to be, uh, was designed to fit m all males, okay? If you were about a, how, how tall are you? You're probably a good height, okay? So you'd have a one-piece suit tailored to your size, sewn a big zipper all the way around here, all around here. You kind of get into it like a union suit or a coveralls. You had three suits at that time built for you, a primary suit, a flight suit, or well, a primary and flight suit, a backup, and a training suit. Three suits were basically tailored to your size. When all these astronauts retired back then, all the suits retired with them. So right now, Smithsonian Institute has so many spacesuits, they don't know what to do, and they're, they're like cordwood down the basement. They're having problems storing them safely without deteriorating. You know, there's on some website on it. Right now, Hamilton, we are helping them try to restore the space, to uh, even maintain proper storage of the suits, okay? So basically, there were so many spacesuits made back then, they don't know what to do with them, okay? Now, what we do on, on the present suits, there's a misconception. We've only built at Hamilton. We are the prime contractor for the present spacesuit, the shuttle and the, uh, the space station suit. We've only built a total of only 18 spacesuits over the last 25 years. It takes us three years to make one. There are 19,000 parts in one spacesuit. And basically, it keeps you alive eight hours outside. Now, this only kept you alive basically, uh, uh, what do you call it, about, about four and a half hours of walk on the moon. Weighs three, uh, the present spacesuit weighs 300 pounds. What we do is, this, this, this thing is, we lost two suits on the Columbia, two suits on the Challenger. You don't live in the spacesuit inside the shuttle or the, the, or the uh, shuttle. You live in your street clothes. So you only have two spacesuits at the most. Sometimes you may have three because they, one time they, paired, they, they captured a satellite or they did something with three spacesuits. But there are only really two spacesuits on board. We lost two in the Columbia, two in the Challenger. We're down to 14 spacesuits to complete building the space station and do other spacewalks. And we are flying at Mach 25. Okay, all I'm trying to say, by mixing and matching different parts, torso and the pants and legs, we can fit from a six foot two person down to a maybe a five foot two person, uh, male or female, by mixing and matching these parts. We've only made a total of 18 spacesuits, we're down to 14. We, this is a, a cost issue. If you could put one spacesuit together and put a cost on it, it'd be roughly $12 million, okay? Now, so now we are flying a Mach 25 with 25-year-old spacesuits. You can hang them up here in the museum as an exhibit, okay? So anyway, so we're not building anymore right now. And anyway, we've got some 80 subcontractors to help us build it. 20% of the cost of the spacesuit and the complexity is the suit itself. 
80% of the complexity is the life support system. Okay. Uh, does that, uh, I'm, did we, okay, I'm trying to get into this, to the Apollo stuff here now. And uh, cheers. We're, you, anybody here want to work on a microgravity microbrewery with me? No, no. <laughs> what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set the stage a little bit for the Apollo. Since we have the Apollo here, I'm going to set up two things. Here is the schematic for, uh, uh, sorry, oh, thank you again. This is the schematic for the lunar module. The reason I'm showing you that, I'm not going to go through it, is just to say this is a two-man system. If you, know, if you know the Apollo program, three astronauts took the translunar situation to the moon, two of the guys got into the, uh, to the lunar module, and they went to the moon in this two-man system. And here are your, here are your two astronauts uh, down here, one there, one there, living off a system that has all of the requirements to live, keep you alive in space. The basic requirements are to remove the carbon dioxide. That's the biggest problem. If you're inside of a cabin with no life support system, totally enclosed, the first thing that happen to you is you'll be, come have too much CO2. Okay, you, you won't run out of oxygen at first. You have too much CO2. So we gotta take care of the CO2. So we have now is, uh, we have the CO2 removal systems. Where are they, da, 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 right over, where they go? Anyway, some here on there. Who knows, I can't even, I can't even see it. Anyway, see, here is one right here. This is, this is the actual, if you've seen the movie Apollo 13, this is the round, that is a CO2 removal system, lithium hydroxide. Anybody been in a submarine? Remember the old standby was lithium hydroxide. But basically that's a CO2 removal system. Then we got what you also breathe out, you breathe carbon dioxide, two more things you breathe out. What do you breathe out? Water, water vapor, you gotta take care of the water. How do you take care of water vapor in zero gravity? Also you breathe out heat. <laughs> so we got, we gotta do, we gotta take care of the heat. Every spacecraft made, including the spacesuit, you have to remove heat, otherwise you'd overheat in space. The lunar module has to be uh, rejected heat. The, sh the space shuttle, the space shuttle opens its cargo bay doors, and those are space radiators. So we radiate heat to space. We have Freon, Freon 21. Any air conditioner guys here? Freon 21. Okay, I told that to a teacher and, and then she, the class, and she came back here later. You have Freon in space? <laughs> yes, we do. Have you ever, ever well, what we do is, when we build even hydraulic systems, we have we got hydraulic fluid going through them, or Freon, or oxygen. We test them with helium. We take and pressurize all of our systems with helium. Helium is one of the smaller molecules, H, okay? If we leak helium and we check it out by a mass spectrometer, we know we will not leak Freon. So we do our homework again to make sure we don't leak those. But anyway, that's how we, but we cool that. Now, here again are the two these are, again, the, this is the LEM, LEM system. Basically, you have two astronauts. You have this lithium hydroxide. Here's your lithium hydroxide right there. Then we gotta, we gotta take the, we gotta have two fans. Redundancy is very important. These fans were inside a 100% pure oxygen, about 16 volts DC. What, what happens when you got carbon brushes? You got a problem. We had to develop, and we pushed the, the technology of brushless DC motors back then, okay? Brushless DC motors back in the 60s. Okay, that's where your spin-offs come from space. Then you come out of that, you gotta cool it. This here is a cooling system, okay? Wa you got moisture coming in the cave, like a locker room. Well, what you do is you cool it down about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and guess what? Little drops of water start coming out in zero gravity, okay? And now, now we got what we call a two-phase flow. Any plumbers here? Plumbers? Well, in plumbers, you, well, what happens is the water goes down the bottom of the pipe, and the, of course the air is on top of it. Well, in space, all, it's all mixed up flowing down the pipe. So now we have to have a separator. These two little devices here are urine, are, not urine, I got a urine separator over here, but I will talk about it later. But basically, you now spin up the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the there's a spinning drum driven by a turbine. We actually use oxygen to spin up this turbine, and we spin it off, and we have artificial gravity, pick it up on a pitot tube. That pitot tube is on the airplane, you measure airspeed. Well, we take that pitot tube and we drive water into it and we get a pressure out. 
we get dynamic pressure, and we pump that water back out, the water that is condensed from the astronaut's sweat is helped to help cool the spacesuit, to help cool the, uh, the spacecraft. That's how, how concerned we were going to the moon. Yes? Uh, that would be an issue. Well, that's, that's all the electronics. If you look at the, I don't have the lunar module life support system, but all the electronics were covered with Teflon coating. The connectors, somebody makes connectors here, I think, okay? Those connectors could not spark or have an arc across them. Yes? That's a brush. That's a brush type DC motor, a brushed motor. You got a, like an electric drill. You got brushes in there. That's the commutation of it. Brushless DC motors. The commutation is done by electronics, or by uh, other means. Okay, that is no spark. Brushless DC motors. It's a new uh, wave of technology. Okay. Uh, that's a two-man system. That system became the lifeboat on the Apollo 13. But now let's go to the. Uh, to the backpack. Since we got the backpack here, I'd like to kind of show it a little bit. And this is the this is the backpack nomenclature. But basically, what we have here is the life support system. There are two life support systems on board the lunar module when they went to the moon. There was also a secondary system on top of this would be a secondary oxygen system, which was basically consisted of two pressurized bottles of pure oxygen at 6,000 psi. Six, now that's if you get any hydrocarbons in there, we've had we've had uh, we had one misfortune back in Hamilton where we had a they were testing the spacesuit with a high pressure oxygen and some some uh, oil got into the system, and there was a spontaneous fire right there. So we had actually we got to make sure we don't have that, but we never had a problem in flight. But there's a there's a secondary system up here, and this is the main system. This main system is regenerative. What I mean by that is you as you consume oxygen, what you do is you lower the pressure a little bit inside the cabin. Okay. Then you have to have makeup oxygen. So there's an oxygen tank. This is about a, this, the, the, prime, the regenerative system, about a 700 psi oxygen tank. This is the oxygen tank. Okay, then you have a water system. There's also water. This is a water tank, and there's another water tank inside here. Uh, there's a battery. This is, a, this is a 16 16.2 volts uh, battery at that time. You had to change the batteries every time it went out. Okay, you had, this is the fan. This is the oxygen fan right here. This is the lithium, oxi ox uh, lithium hydroxide container. This is the sublimator. The sublimator is a heat exchanger. Uh, it's basically designed to freeze up. You got, a, you got one of these uh, crazy American cars that got a radiator? Well, you don't worry about here in San Diego. But up in, in uh, Connecticut, if you don't put antifreeze in, it's going to freeze up. Well, we, have a, we have a heat exchanger here designed to freeze up. How do we cool the astronaut in space? In here is, eight, is a, a water. What we do is your body metabolic heat rate in space is roughly 1,000 BTUs an hour. In other words, when right now when you're probably sitting, you're, kind of, you're in zero gravity right now, okay? You're generating about maybe 500 to 1,000 BTUs an hour. That's your heat rate. Okay, now, all I'm trying to say is that, let me go back to a little bit here, that basically what we do is parts of the spacesuit are made of different pieces. This is the pressure vessel. And this inside is 100% pure oxygen at 4.3 PSIA. You can live with the partial pressure of oxygen. It's not hypergolic. It is lower pressure. In other words, if you take away nitrogen, nitrogen just goes through your lungs back out for the ride. So you can take away that nitrogen pressure. You can lower the pressure of the spacesuit. Much more flexible. But that's what we have, 100% pure oxygen. The next layer is five layers of aluminized mylar. Very gossamer material. OK, if you'll notice, there are holes in here. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, anyway, the holes in it. We put five layers on the outside. Okay, here's a situation whereby we actually put the astronaut in a flexible thermos bottle. Remember the old thermos bottles you used to take to school? Two layers of glass. Inside those two layers of glass, what was there? Vacuum. Vacuum. Yes, a vacuum is an excellent insulator. We allow a space vacuum on the outside of the spacesuit to get between these five layers. So we actually got the astronaut in a flexible thermos bottle. Now, if you're in space. With that sot, you're above the atmosphere. You got this hot sun hitting you on the front. If you put an outdoor thermometer out here, you can be reading plus 250 degrees. Okay. On your night side, as you radiate heat away, well, of course, up in up in uh, Connecticut, we worry about that. It gets real. The other night, we were down about 22. You know, it was clear night. All the heat went out in space. 
you could be minus 200 degrees. So you are inches away from being frozen and rotated to death. You want to continue this mission? <laughs> mm, yeah, okay. Now the outside layer is, I'll just go through, this is the outside layer of the spacesuit. This is Kevlar, uh, and this is the new suit, but they didn't have Kevlar back in those days, but they had just Teflon coating. So that's the outside for fireproof and all that. Anyway, the first ounce of protection for thermal conditions is this long underwear. Now there's a fashion statement, right? <laughs> this is made for astronaut car. This has been patented by Hamilton Sunstrand back in standard back in the 1960s. But we developed this suit to about 250 feet of water hose sewn into this suit. We actually pump water from this water system with a water pump down here. There's a water pump in here. We pump water through this. This is the first step of taking heat away from your body. Okay, we keep your body core temperature quite uh, comfortable. Anyway, what you have in here on the back side of this, on the back side we have a whole bunch of hoses, and we have a water hose that will come off of here. You take this, this is, this is the stored position when they have it inside the lunar module. But we can take, we've got a lock here, you pull this, pull this over, turn it, and you got this little water hose connection. That plugs into this blue connector here, and we pump water through it. So you take heat away from your body quite naturally. You keep this around maybe this is around maybe 80 some degrees. Your body core temperature may be around 80. You know, of course, you're 98 points, uh, 98.6. So you want to start taking heat away from your body. Then you pump it into this heat exchanger. This heat exchanger now is basically starts to freeze. What temperature does water boil at sea level? You're at San Diego. You boil your eggs. What temperature water boil here? 212. Okay, you go to Mount, you go to Denver. What temperature? Any Denver people? About 205 degrees, 208 degrees. Denver. Go to Mount Everest. Maybe 200. Maybe 150 degrees. Go in space. What temperature water boil in space? 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Zero degrees Celsius. What temperature water freeze in space? 32 degrees Fahrenheit. You are below the triple point of water. So we have a heat exchanger here that we pump water into it. We pump water in this heat exchanger, and it basically sees space vacuum. It sees space vacuum, and it starts to freeze. Okay, and then you, you block off the other. If it didn't freeze properly, you'd be spewing water to space. Basically, what you do is you block it off. You get a 32-degree heat sink, and therefore, you keep this. You keep, you got a nice radiator here that stays at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. For every pound of water that you boil away, you reject about 1,000 BTUs of heat, and that's your metabolic heat rate for one hour. So you need one pound of water for every hour that you're in the spacesuit. So every space, that had about eight pounds, of, about six or seven pounds of water. The present spacesuit has around nine, 10 pounds of water. That makes sense? Okay. So therefore, that's part of the suit. Okay, now, uh, the next thing we have to worry about is, we talked about oxygen, lithium hydroxide. Here is the lithium hydroxide container. Again, what we had here is, this is titanium, okay? We had here, we have, we had taken the chemical out because it's basically caustic, but we'd have, you'd flow in this, this CO2-laden oxygen, it'd go through this, and be, uh, you would scrub out the CO2. Lithium hydroxide, mix it with CO2, you get lithium, uh, you get lithium carbonate and water. After a little while, this will turn to mush. So these only have a certain life to it. Anyway, on board the lunar module, on Apollo 13, we got the call. We got in Houston, we have a problem. Remember that one? We had our engineers at Hamilton at the time, and we all came into work. The lunar module, which I showed you before, the system I showed you before, I'll go back to that right now since I might as well talk about that system. But this system right here basically was designed for only 48 hours for two astronauts on the moon. You two guys are on the moon, okay? And basically that was the, that was the logistics. We had, we had two of these for each bag. You come back in, you take the old one out, put a new one in, go back out for the next spacewalk. Then we also, in this system here, we had a big one. We had an all-day an all day system. This one right here was the last all day, so we had two of those, one for 24 hours, one for uh, the next 48 hours, and then we had a secondary one that was used for changeover. This is a small one, which is the same size as this. So we designed these two to be, to be coexistent. Air research that built the command module out there, they designed theirs a square. Now, we thought that this is more 
uh, more efficient from an engineering point of view, better uh, radial dispersion of the gases through here. Air research, with all everything you do in engineering is a trade-off. They design their square. They could stow them better. You know, you stow these, you got round, you got cracks between them. So basically, what we are happen is NASA says, "Hey, you're running out of." We knew it too. You're running out of uh, lithium hydroxide. The first problem. Furthermore, the cabin was cooling down, and chemical reactions slow down as you get colder. So we had our engineers calculating how long these things are going to last, and wham! We see, hey, we got a problem. You know, we got a lithium hydroxide problem. So what they did is just like the movie shows. We got together with NASA. We would, uh, our prime contractor was Grumman Aircraft down in Bethpage, New York. We got together with them and NASA. And we come up with a way to use the fan, since we couldn't uh, press spread this in the cabin because it was caustic and zero gravity, we had to basically use the fan, this fan system here, and use that to blow it through a, um, a hose, one of the umbilical hoses, and then use the square ones. We had to make a little duct, a uh, little uh, uh, plenum that would duct it into out of the car card of one of the um, uh, structure manuals. So you will know all that history. We were also worried about water. Aboard the lunar module, we needed water to cool the craft, even though it was getting cool. We had 435 pounds of water. Immediately, what we did is we took all of our equipment, all of our water systems in that. We had wa uh, water tanks and everything else, water boilers up there. We put them all in a row, flat. How do you test in zero gravity something that's going to work in zero gravity when in the ground? So we put all of our stuff on a tabletop and tested it for 435 pounds of water to run that during that 40, during that timeline. We had to make this system last for 96 hours for three astronauts. We knew our hardware was robust to do the job, yes. Well, e well, with lithium hydroxide inside, you c well, meaning according, meaning these things would collapse. Not with lithium, not with a chemical inside, because it's full. It's, it's solid. It's a solid block. Right now, I got the chemical out of it. But you really can't. Uh, I know you now water tanks in space. Our water tanks are mostly accordion type water tanks because we want to make sure we get 100% water expulsion out. So we have to have a pressure. We can't just have water inside of a tank. You're not going to get all the water out. So you got to then you got to have some kind of accordion device with a pressure vessel over the outside to push the bellows. So yeah, there are several ways to do it. But they design it square. We designed it round. Okay. So that's uh. So we were considering using urine to help cool the spacecraft. We actually had a method. Inside the, the uh, lunar module, there were urine transfer hoses. But that was, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the high tech part of it, <laughs> if you want to call it. Uh, but basically, uh, we were using water. But they, got, they actually got through that system. And Schweiker came to Hamilton Standard back in a couple months afterwards, shook a 1,000 hands, said, I'm glad to be home. This is the first time that we were faced with losing somebody in space. Now, I talked to a lot of kids. I've talked about maybe 400,000 kids on space over my last uh, lifetime, if you want to call it that, uh, with Dr. Flush and else. But to the, ki to the kid that's not like Arnold Schwarzenegger saving the world, like in, uh, in Term Terminator and all those things, this, the movie itself, Apollo 13, which most kids have seen. Have you seen that movie? Yeah. yeah okay. What do you think of it? Oh, well, it's perfect. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm destroyed. <laughs> But basically, uh, it's like showing how a teamwork comes together. Now, of course, we know the guys came back from the moon, OK? What they, they're worried about, the lunar virus, OK? And so basically, they, they actually got, I got a picture over there on the counter over there. I got a picture of President Nixon looking into this Airstream trailer. These guys are inside this thing for, for two weeks. They were worried about some strange virus, OK? You, you know, something, I don't know, they're going to bring back from the moon. Anyway, so. Basically, what the doctors, they poked and prodded these three guys, and they, they, they found out they had, basically they had a slight mental problem. They said they had a bad case of lunar ticks. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go away from the, uh, later on, you can look at this hardware in more detail. I can talk for several hours on it, but uh, let's go on to some fun stuff. We want, I think we're about halfway there. Let's go into, the, how about the space toilets, okay? Okay. Uh, we got a lot of equipment here, and uh, I'm going to go into that right now. And so let's proceed beyond. We're going to go where no man has gone before, or woman. Okay, okay. We got <laughs> uh, 
Dr. Flush came into being because of the fact that uh, really we had to worry about some problems. And uh, we were, we had to consider things like water and stuff. But let me talk about life and zero gravity slightly, slightly. And here's kind of what we use to get into Dr. Flush. This is a, this is a kind of an astronaut kind of in space. In space, you kind of like assume the neutral position. Your muscles tend to go like if you're drifting in a tank, a pool of water, all your muscles kind of, if you went to sleep in space, you'd kind of be like that if you had no restraints. Anyway, uh, you need oxygen, all these kind of stuff. You need water, you need food, and everything else. However, what comes out? CO2, about two pounds of CO2 come out per day. This is per day. Uh, you, get about, you get about five pounds of water comes out of your body every day. Okay, if you can condense it, you get five pounds of water back in the system. Okay, uh, urine. You get three, over three pounds of urine per day. Have you ever measured that? No, you don't. You're no fun. <laughs> Okay, on the Skylab, we had to measure urine per day from an astronaut. Okay, I'll talk. I got some stuff over here. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is the longer you stay in space, the more you recycle like Mother Earth. And the shuttle, you go up, take your stuff up, and bring your garbage back with you. Okay, this, the Skylab, you start to recycle a little bit. Space station, you can recycle it quite a bit. Now, you go down to that other fe fecal matter, fecal water, only 0.2 pounds of water. All I'm trying to say on the space station is not efficient to recycle the water out of fecal matter. Now, if you went to Mars, now you may dump the stuff in a big mushroom patch, and there, there's where you start getting your water back from uh, there. So all I'm trying, there are points that we go through and decide how far down this, this affluent side, the output side, do we worry about bringing it back over to the input side. So you get the general drift here. We, every mission, we decide that differently. Okay? Now, uh, also, water in space. Here is a picture in space of zero gravity. And basically, this is a piece of equipment in the shuttle. What am I trying to do here? OK. This is, a, this is a called a water separator. It's a device, again, we like we spin up a drum with a PO tube in it pu pumping off water. Anyway, it got clogged with, with cosmic dust or something. I don't know, space uh, stumbleweed, who knows. But if you can see this piece of equipment here, but see this little line here? This is a bubble of water. OK? OK, see that little line there? That is a, a bubble of water in zero gravity hanging around this whole per, uh, this piece of equipment. It clog up. In other words, it just hangs around the wires. OK, it doesn't run off. OK, so we never tested our equipment to do this. But also, you'll notice this is the output. There's the air, come, air is coming out here. Air is rushing down here, rushing down here. It hits this, and it it actually depresses the water into a little bit of a, a, a recess there. That's because of air velocity only. Otherwise, it'd be a perfect sphere, kind of. So keep that in mind, OK, for other things. And um, so that's, uh, we'll, we'll put that one back. And now what we're going to do is we'll kind of go into in search of the perfect flush. Now, there's a lot of problems out there. And one of them is, this is going back to my history again. This is the outhouse that we had back in Wisconsin. <laughs> There's a problem with this. What's wrong with this picture? Now, this is on the moon. If you had an outhouse on the moon, what do you put on the door? A picture of the Earth. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> even even uh, you got it, right? OK. <laughs> OK. Now, basically, also, we have some problems in space, too. If, if your system fails, <laughs> OK, if your system, thanks to gravity, fails, OK, if you're, you get a lot of not notoriety. This was syndicated in the Chicago Tribune. Back in uh, December 90, there are seven astronauts running off the shuttle to the nearest outhouse. <laughs> also, uh, we, we, were the, we were the butt of back in 1983, or we had just put our first spacesuits on the shuttle. We were the butt of joke of Bob Hope. We just put these space, two spacesuits on the shuttle. And this is the, the shuttle spacesuits, 300 pounds worth of machinery. And they were in a checkout 
inside the cabin before they went out to space. Okay? Both suits failed. We have never had a failure in space. Both suits failed. Okay, so we had to scrub the, the spacewalk, or they did the flight and all that kind of stuff, fine. But Bob Hope picks up on it. You know, he has them, uh, just like all the comedians, they have their monologues first. So we had these NASA went up there, and they took these two spacesuits up worth millions, and they said, well, gee whiz, they had a failure. We found out why they cost so much. NASA hired these famous spacesuit designers from France, namely Christian Diorbit and Bill Blastoff. Now that's, you know, that one you have to explain to them, okay? These are old French designers, okay? Anyway, so that's some, no. Okay, now what I need is to talk, uh, to, what time we got now? We got, okay, well, that's fine. That's pretty good. Uh, we do things in space with kind of like countdowns, okay? So what I'd like to have you do is to give me a countdown starting from 10. You know, you know 10? Can you start out? 10? 10? Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, three point two, two point one, flush. Now we can talk about the right stuff. Okay, here's the. <laughs> I never got applause from older people like this before, but kids love it. <laughs> Either I'm impressed in something. Anyway, I had to go around work and collect 6,000 pounds of urine. Okay, NASA said we had a, we had a, a program where we had to now build a toilet that would lay uh, stay in, could stay in space. Okay, there's I'll go through some other problems, but so uh, to do all this to collect the right stuff, to do all these things, I kind of came up with a little suit. We treat building the commode with the same discipline as building the spacesuit and other hard work. So basically, uh, we put a little humor into it, okay? So you can laugh right now. That's very fine, okay? Anyway, this did help at work quite a bit. You ever going to work with a costume? You know, does it help sometimes? Okay, sometimes. But anyway, so let me go back into a little bit of history here, okay? Uh, I'm not going to go through all these, okay? <laughs> but basically, let's go back to the Apollo. What was Apollo about? We call it the bag, okay? At that time, it was all male, okay? Three guys, one, two, three. You get three guys to go on the moon. 25,000 miles an hour to escape the Earth's gravitational field. The shuttle only has to go Mach 25 at 17,500 miles, which is five miles per second, okay? We're not going to speed of light, guys and girls, okay? Anyway, to go to the moon, 25,000 miles an hour. One day out, okay, NASA was saying, hey, you are real heroes, because on the lunar module, and on the, on the Apollo, there was no bathroom, no toilet, okay? That's why you're real heroes. So NASA said, we're going to be nice here. We're going to give you a whole bunch of what I call pee and poo pouches. This is a pee pouch, and this is a poo pouch. And don't get the two confused, because the wrong pouch will not work in the right place. You got the drift? <laughs> this is the guy thing now, okay? Also, I'm an engineer. I can only do one thing at a time. You got to make that nanosecond decision, number one or number two, first or second. <laughs> See how complicated it gets to go to the bathroom in space? Okay, so here you are going to the moon one day out. I'll forget about the pee pouch, okay, put that there, but you gotta use the poo pouch. You kinda lift off your seat, you say, excuse me, excuse me. Open up your little poo pouch. No instructions necessary, okay? Here it is, and there you go, voila. Okay, you take this little sticky area off here and paste it right back here where the sun doesn't shine, okay? <laughs> Now, you go home tonight and sit down and think about this. <laughs> well, you can sit down tonight and think about it. Once a day to think about Dr. Flush, okay? Anyway. Oh, Lord, give us strength. Give us strength, okay? You got strength, okay? Now, you, you, what happens is, in space, your body waste wants to stay with you, okay? Body waste is sticky. Remember, see that little that water bubble I showed you there? It sticks to you. Surface tension takes over. Gravity isn't there. Okay, so therefore, you got so now you got to kind of, I can't see back either, and you got to help him out, okay? <laughs> they, even though they made this now, uh, uh, basically, so here you are. Uh, now, where does the smell go? The genie gets out of the bag, right? You got to grin and bear it. I know it's your grinning, okay? 
So you can't go over and turn the bathroom fan on and wipe out the neighbor's space aliens. Because inside that cabin, you have precious oxygen going to the moon 25, 35 years ago. Okay? So basically, when you're done, you kind of peel it off with a little peach fuzz that comes with it. You take the, uh, also, you've got a little, little bit of a finger area here. You can kind of help clean out a little bit. You got tissue. You do have tissue. Tissue paper works in space. It works great. That works. So, so you put the, wipe yourself, put the tissue paper in here, seal it up, and the astronauts believe in redundancy. What they would do is they would put it inside of the, um, where did I put my bag? Put it inside the redundant bag, and they would basically store it on board. Now, the urine, on the urine, they could transfer the urine. There's two ends of this. There's the Texas catheter on this side, okay? You put it over yourself, all guys this time, okay? And then, of course, the, the other thing was, um, well, basically, they said there was small, medium, and large, okay? And astronauts, always being real men, <laughs> always ordered large, okay? So we had to rename them large, gigantic, and humongous, okay? <laughs> the, the last part is, uh, is just a joke, okay? Anyway, so, but this, you could take this and fill this bag up. You had two valves. You had one valve in your body and one valve at the pinch area right here. So you had, you had to coordinate those two valves. Otherwise, you have a little green, you have little yellow raindrops going through the cabin, okay? But you could transfer this into the second half of this bag and transfer into urine ba storage area so you could kind of transfer it out of the bags, okay? Now, that, that was the, the, uh, the, the, the Apollo approach. Well, along comes... Along comes Skylab. Skylab is very interesting. Skylab was a medical mission. And the medical mission put also a lot of, when they came back from the moon, they wanted to sit down toilet. I think you would too if you were an astronaut at that time. So uh, Skylab. Skylab came along and basically there is Alan Bean in the space state and the Skylab using the urinal. Okay, we had a relief tube. Are you pilots here? Relief tube pilots? You're experienced relief tube? We have a gent, we call it in space, uh, we also do in space from day one, we always collect the solid waste separate from the urine. Uh, as you remember, in, at Hamilton, we've been reclaiming urine back to usable water since 1965, okay? We don't want to contaminate the two. Urine from a healthy person is basically sterile, and uh, basically you can, uh, you can reclaim it quite easy if you put some preservatives, preservatives in it so you don't have biofouling and all that kind of stuff. Anyway. This is the toilet. Uh, if you go down the Smithsonian Institute, you can see this commode in the Skylab. They have an extra Smith, uh, they built out the 22 uh, foot diameter of the second stage of the Saturn rocket. There it is, okay? We had three astronauts on board. We were required to measure the void, the urination from one, two, three astronauts from the mission every day. Okay, so how do you measure, how do you, how do you weigh yourself in zero gravity? You can, we can. You, there's a, I think the, at the museum here, you have a device. It's a nursery device. You, you put in a spring device, you measure the, the spring rate and the time constant, and you back calculate it into the mass, okay? Anyway, so now here is a, over there is the, the seat, the toilet seat on that little chair over there. You may not see, but that was hanging on the wall. So you put your tush against the wall. The black one or the white one? The one on the, uh, no. There is, uh, there's the best seats in the house, right there. Now that was all. That was all male. So there was no. There was. The, we're not designing for females yet. Okay. So basically, you would defecate into the little hole, little air entrainment, little gentle airflow to keep you know what going the right place. Okay. Then you had the the funnel there. Okay. Now, there's a problem with this picture though. When we look at this picture, up here, we see foot restraints. In reality, the picture should be like this. In space, literally, you can piss up a rope. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> now, here is some real equipment. Here is a stainless steel urine separator. Each astronaut had one. What we would do is you'd urinate into their three, three inputs. Or, or this is the urine air input. This is the gas outlet, and this is the urine outlet. So you, you have a rotating drum in here. You spin it up. You have a pitot tube that pulls, uh, pumps off the urine in this little bag. And then we had to measure the amount per day. You put a bag in here that would fit right over here, right like that. And for one day, for one astronaut, you'd put in this little bag, and you'd take it out at the end of the day. And now you'd have your day's quantity of urine in here, OK? Then you'd have to go over, and you could, there's a method that they came up with 
to be able to determine the amount of urine in here by putting some unknown X amount of chemical. And then you'd have to take the little Dixie cup. You ever try to fill up one of these in space? <laughs> and it's a problem. So here is, here is an actual uh, zero gravity little urine sense specimen. Okay, what they would do is they would take this bag out of the machine, pump, plug it into a little valve here, and squeeze in about maybe uh, 25, 30 milliliters of urine. And they came back with every day on the, on the Apollo, when they came back from the Skylab mission, they had every astronaut had this day's worth of little specimen here. So they could analyze it back. That's how they found out how they physically, what happened to the body. There are roughly 20, 35, 30, 30 things that happen to your body in space. And one of them is by doing urine sample analysis. Okay, so we never, we still have not had a chance to get back to that detail of operation yet. That's the space station uh, uh, challenge yet. I'm, cheers. Okay, now. Okay, that's the uh, Skylab. Now comes along the, uh, oh, this is it. Now comes along the, we lost, we lost uh, there are two actual commodes for the shuttle. The first one, as I said before, we were actually doing testing to compete with another company that built and won the contract for the shuttle. We won the life support systems. We won, we won the CO2, the heat transfer. So we don't care about. So over here on the left side, right side, is the present shuttle come, uh, toilet, which is made by another company. Anyway, that system was designed to collect all this stuff in space and bring it back, OK? Not quite as much of a challenge as the space station. Space station probably had to stay up there. Well, so what I mean by that is, uh, well, anyway, the, the, the other one on the left side over here is the space station version. That's the one I'll talk about. That's the one I worked on. Anyway, what happens is, after every shuttle flight, it has to be taken off the shuttle. There's a 2.7 cubic foot bowl full of the right stuff. OK? And what we, uh, we as, and let me put in a little bit more history. After the Challenger incident, when we were developing the space station toilet, the other company washed their hands of this one. And we said, OK, we'll take it. So now we service this one, OK? And basically, we get our, what we do is we take it to UPS. No, they won't take it. <laughs> so NASA has to fly it up to Houston, OK, because it's full of the right, the, the right stuff. We get the employee of the month, and we got to clean out the bulb. There's no flush ports. There's a four-inch diameter hole. The second, the black one over there is the space shuttle uh, type toilet. You can go over and sit now. What we have on that one, basically, this was the system. Uh, over here was a 2.7 cubic foot bowl. You sat on a four-inch diameter seat, OK? And uh, not far below you was this wearing blender, so 12, uh, about 1,100 RPM slinger. The astronauts would say, it's very disconcerting to sit on this thing. <laughs> the whole idea was you had airflow going through here, come around here, the motor fan down here. But the idea was the, the you know what would hit the fan. <laughs> Literally, OK? So what happened is you'd have this stuff slung over into the outside of this bowl. You'd have this like uh, this like this uh, brown stucco, OK? Uh, brown stucco you got on the side of the walls here. <laughs> that would be pasted around this bowl. Then you would physically put the toilet paper in there, and it would hit the fan again, and it would shred it up. It was the compactor. Beautiful idea. In fact, we had that same kind of idea back in the 70s, too, when we had, we had Army nurses doing KC-135 flights doing this thing, too. Anyway, the problem was, after you're done, you would cover up, the, you would kind of lift yourself off the seat. You would have a slide valve here that would shut that four-inch diamond hole. It was designed by a golfer, I think because this is the same size as a, as a divot, OK? That's four inch hole. <laughs> anyway, uh, you, cut, you, would slide, you cut off that hole there, and you'd open up a one inch valve to space. You would basically freeze dry the paper mache, and what would happen? The water would go away, and now you had brown powder. The next person that came along would open up this seat here. The slinger would come on, and you'd, have a, you'd sit down, you have a four inch brown tattoo on yourself that was not necessarily your own. <laughs> There was some early, there was some early, early flights where they literally had some medical conversations. You may have heard about this, that they were private, so to speak, and basically that was part of the problem. Within a couple of flights, they removed the slinger, okay, very quickly because, uh, in fact, they were using surgical masks sometimes after they used the toilet. 
okay, because of the stuff that would actually come out of it. If you didn't sit down quick enough, you had the little uh, the debris around. So what they did is they took out the slinger, and now they just fill out the bowl, okay? There were other problems. With that. That's, the, that's the version right now. We service that commode right now. After every shuttle flight, we service it, okay? Furthermore, there was a problem, an earlier problem. This is down at NASA. You may have heard about this room, maybe, maybe not. But this is down in Building 7. This one, the uh, focus is quite bad here, sorry. Uh, I can't get any as far as it goes. Good, anyway, uh, general picture. Over, this was the positional trainer, positional trainer. Now, all I'm trying to say is that if you look at this seat, the astronauts were complaining they got little brown skid marks on this. They said, gee whiz. And the NASA said, well, you don't know where your important parts are, you know. So, in, but in space, literally, you can sit on a pail and be comfortable because there's no body weight on you, okay? Anyway, so they actually had said, they told the astronauts, you got to learn how to aim, okay? <laughs> so you would sit on this one right here and do a, you would kind of like position yourself, and then you'd turn on this switch over here, and a camera would look at something you never saw before. So if you got 9 out of 10 visual bullseyes, <laughs> you graduated to the functional trainer, OK? <laughs> well, OK, the Dr. Flush theory was, that this is a Dr. Flush theory, was that we're not all perfect back there. In space, well, on, gra on the gravity, it kind of straightens it out, OK? But in space, you can come out like little curlicues, kind of. Like, uh, I don't know. Anyway, the Dr. Flush theory is you got to have a bigger seat. So if you look at the space station version, you'll see a bigger seat. And we don't have a problem with that one, okay? <laughs> okay, let's graduate to the present uh, toilet, okay? And uh, we had to, now the space station comes along, and now we had co ed situations. We had to keep the stuff in space for many, many, we had, to, we had to send the toilet up, and we couldn't bring it back even, okay? So consider the issue. So, uh, if I can find, okay, here's the, uh, here is the new toilet we have. This was the space station concept. We only built one, and that is the space station concept. It is designed to be able to be have co-ed situations. We have to take care of all the absorbency products, the menstrual waste, the, uh, the diarrhea, vomitous waste, what have you, okay? And we even think food products, well, you know, it could be used as a trash compactor if you wanted to, but anyway, you'll notice here, the, some of the features, uh, okay, where'd my, who knows? Here's my uh, Home Depot pointer here. But you'll notice here is the urinal hose. There is a urinal hose attached to this. Uh, this is the seat area right here. And of course, down here is a septic tank. Now, in the space toilet, sorry, I'm in your way, there is no water. On the space station, well, let me put it this way. On the shuttle, UTC, United Technology, they make fuel, they make the fuel cells. So when you put hydrogen and oxygen together for electricity, what do you get? You get water and electricity and water, a byproduct of water. You get so much water, we've got to throw it away. In fact, when they dock with the space station, they give them water. Well, what's the power supply for the space station? It's solar panels, okay, 120 volts DC. You got 120 volts DC to run your bathroom at home? Okay, <laughs> so that's the other situation. So this, uh, so we have here is we have a system that has no water, okay, and this is a seat. We actually use natural biodegradation. We can't throw anything overboard either, and we've got to be able to clean the commode out. Okay, and on board the shuttle right now, uh, what's your name again? Blaine. Huh? Blaine? Okay, on board the shuttle right now, guess what? There is no sink, there's no shower, there's no refrigerator, there's no mom and dad, and there's no gravity. Yes! <laughs> okay, now, you got yourself in trouble now. Who cleans the bathroom, Blaine? No, you're, no mom and dad. So you go home tonight and do some early astronaut training. You help your mom and dad clean the bathroom. We have a clean machine, no water, okay? This is the machine. It weighs, it weighs about 250 pounds. It was designed to fly in the, it flew on the shuttle four times to prove out, because how do you prove out a toilet in space, on the ground? I mean, we, we actually put the, uh, we test the, the astronauts in a pool. And how are we doing in time, okay? We test the astronauts in a pool. And we can actually take this, the spacesuits, become beautiful diving suits. You put nuclear buoyancy in them, and you check the three-dimensional uh, choreograph of the, of the shuttle walk. Okay? I put the, the toilet in the pool, nobody wanted to use it. <laughs> 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 I 
Um, the water, <laughs> water spray boiler. I was the, uh, uh, the lead engineer on the water spray boiler back in the early days of the shuttle. It's a boiler to, again, cool the APUs. It's a steam boiler. We tested it upside down. That's a negative gravity test. If you could take, like, to take the teapot on your stove, take the stove, turn it all upside down, and if we can have water come out as steam before it goes out the spout, we have presented a penalty test that proves it'll work in zero gravity. Because zero gravity is between negative gravity and positive gravity. Okay, so that's, so I put the toilet on the ceiling, nobody wanted to use it. <laughs> no, we have no way, we did our best to design this, okay? Now, okay, that's the, um, that's the, that's the relief tube there. Okay, now, what you do is, here is, we found, for you astronomers, any astronomers, we found the black hole of space, right, right there. <laughs> What we have here is, we have a little bigger seat, okay, and what you do, you uh, below the seat is my, okay, here it is over here. We have here is uh, a little hydrophobic membrane bag, okay. What you do is you lift the lid, guys, okay, okay, and a fan comes on, and the fan opens this bag, one bag per use, okay, so you kind of float over the seat and hold yourself down, otherwise you may have a premature liftoff, okay. <laughs> There are two little, on the previous picture you thaw, saw two little thigh bars, they're string-loaded devices that come over and hold you down with about seven pounds of force, okay, so you have no problem, okay. Now, so basically this bag was a hydrophobic, the water will not, should not go through it at a certain, up to a certain pressure, and basically we use one bag per use, okay. When you're done, you lift this, you kind of put your tissue paper in here, of course, uh, the liquid waste goes off in the urinal, I'll show you that, but basically when you're done, you lift the seat, Put a little Tupperware cover, this will be good for your Tupperware parties, okay? <laughs> you bring over a compactor, and you compact the bag down that little bottom, that little tube, into a little people patty. I call them, the average defecation is 0.245 pounds, so I call them quarter pounders, okay? <laughs> you, Blaine, you won't eat, you won't eat hamburgers anymore, right? <laughs> you're, you're, I hope you put up with this, so I mean. <laughs> anyway, so we end up with uh, a whole stack up of little, uh, uh, little patties at the bottom of this thing, and basically, uh, uh, I won't show that one. <laughs> uh, so, now, I'll go back to, uh, okay, I'll go back to this, I'll go back to this picture. What we do is, after these patties build up, by using, there's no blue waters, no chemicals, nothing to enhance or detract from natural biodegradation. What we do is, when you, okay, another thing you gotta learn, guys, is when you're done with the commode, you do have to put down the fan, the, 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 the seat, because that shuts off the fan. During, we have a power limitation. During, during non-use, quiescent mode of the commode, this, it's all, this whole long eight-foot diameter tube down at the bottom of the transfer tube is all sealed off, except for an exhaust port that goes through the fan that's turned off through an odor bacteria filter into the cabin. So all the odors, all the bacteria, and the operating mode and the quiescent mode are taken care of by the odor bacteria filter. The products of biodegradation, the anaerobic and, bio and, and anaerobic uh, digestion are based on basically CO2 and methane. That's the CO2 is taken care of by the normal CO2 removal system, the lithium hydroxide, and the, uh, the uh, methane is taken care of by the catalytic burner on board the space station. So it's not a problem. So we know when this little canister down here gets full, well, this canister takes about maybe 25 little people patties. We take it off, and it's held in by, by friction. We put a cover on the top, and it's allowed to biodegrade, and gases of evolution come off, come through a filter, charcoal, and membranes to bound to 0.45 microns, which will take care of bacteria. We can, I stored one of those in my office for about a year, and I had no problem. But, uh, I, you know, and basically, also what I did is I basically selected my lottery numbers from some of those. <laughs> okay. So now I'm gonna I'm getting a little warm here, but now have we covered all the issues that go in the bathroom in space. Eight, eight foot long what? That's not eight. Oh, oh, that it was. This is only this this little no. This little canister is about maybe 17 inches tall. We bring it back. Okay, Dr. Flush is that article. We bring it back to Earth because we need to, if you're like an experiment, when you're done, you throw a yellow tag into it. 
And I, this has come back from space. This one here is my test one. They're not made out of fiberglass, uh, plexiglass. They're made out of fiberglass, so you can't see them, okay? This is my test one. But I've done archaeological digs. <laughs> and you can uh, pick up the new tool, tool analysis, okay? We want to find out where the calcium is. Not, everybody in space, most of uh, younger people, have a bone loss density. Uh, you, it's basically, um, uh, you lose calcium. We don't know whether the calcium is destroying faster or the regeneration is slowed down. So we want to do a stool anal analysis and all that stuff. I had an hour-long talk with Shanna Lucid. She was 53 years old when she went on board the Mir. For, for she lived up there for six months with two Russian cosmonauts, Yuri 1 Yuri 2. She came back. She is actually, I'll give you women credit. She actually came back and walked off the shuttle. Wolf, a little bit. He actually had to be carried off the shuttle a little bit with a stretcher because they're in space. You start to lose muscle tone. You get all that, but she walked off the shuttle. In a couple of days, she was doing light, uh, light uh, running and jogging. She actually had a bone density increase in some of her femur bone. And uh, also, for your ladies uh, in space, you've got to work. I don't know. I'm a nuts and bolts engineer. Oh, okay. She may have been 53 years. Maybe she was partially, uh, maybe menopausal, maybe been an es estrogen. I don't know. I didn't ask those questions of this <laughs> the lady. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, oh, the, 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 the two-week one for the shuttle was no bag, by definition. It, it, it was kind of simpler. What, what we found out in our, in our uh, quest for, uh, for the cosmic commode, so to speak, we found out that it was actually more pleasant. I got some pictures I don't want to show because the other astronaut, even with the present commode, the one that has not had the bags in it, you can be slightly soiled from previous uses. So we elected to go and and to the bag use. The bag use is uh, when I showed you this one of the, if you were to float over and see that bag in place, you'd feel a lot better than seeing somebody else's residue down there. You ever go into a porta potty? The local uh, air show or something. Ooh. Anyway, this presents a better. Now, also, what it does is for medical purposes. We come back to Earth. We got these things basically separated into into little uh, sub little uh, stacks. Okay. Now, yes. Well, they, they, the first the first commode I showed you did not have a bag. It was actually simpler by design. It was a concept at that time which they thought worked. But we had a we had a back off. Remember I had the slinger in there first? That was even part of our design in the early days. All I'm trying to say is that we had a back off that because of the dynamics of the slinger. And then it became a real problem. Yes. Okay. And the shuttle can be cleaned up every time it comes back. But the space and that's is no venting to space. That means no venting. Okay, so that's why we had to have a system that we could clean out and leave the commode in space, but just bring back the toilet. I have not talked about yet in the spacesuit. Okay, in the spacesuit itself, thanks to uh, the early days on the Apollo suit, there was a cuff around uh, the right knee, and you'd be again hooked up to the Texas catheter, and you'd urinate into a bag, and as you say, things did leak. Okay, and that was the same situation we did up to the days when up to when Kathy Sullivan flew on the sh on the shuttle and use our spacesuits. At that time, now we couldn't use the catheter, okay? So basically, with the women now, thanks to the ladies, we found out, hey, diapers work better in space. Nothing drips. So basically, right now, this is the space diaper, okay? And we can hold up the three voids. Now, what you're gonna do is, what do you tell your kids when you go on a long car drive? Go to the bathroom before you get in the, in the car, right? You've heard that? I've heard it back in, when, in horse and buggy days, anyway. So what do we tell the astronauts? Go to the bathroom, the shuttle, before you get in the spacesuit. Because basically, because you gotta go through the pre-breathing process, we do not let you uh, come back in and out like the, you know, it's like I put a, oh, up north, we worry about kids on a snow, snow suit. You get them in the snow suit, go out there for eight hours, kid, don't come back in. Anyway, because you use the toilet first, you don't have to defecate them more for eight hours. You're only out in the spacesuit for eight hours. So you, solid waste is not a problem, really. Well, these will take solid waste too, but we not, not that I, I, I don't know of any astronaut yet that I use this for solid waste. 
Inside the spacesuit is relatively dry, roughly about 30% relative humidity, and most of your body moisture comes off as perspiration, as uh, condensed out into the spacesuit system. <coughs> this can hold up to three voids, 980 milliliters of fluid, and nothing drips in space. You take away, you take away the gra force of gravity, and it'll just ball up like that. See that little picture I had there of the spacesuit? Okay. Yes, you had a question. Is that off the shelf or is that it's off the shelf. Howard is made a little bit bigger. More padding is put into it. Uh, here's a case whereby we use, we use pre, uh, uh, space technology, we use technology developed on the ground. Also in here is this new uh, material, it's the, it's the chemicals that when you put liquid into it, it turns into a gel. <coughs> you can take a, uh, put a, a little, about an inch of powder in the bottom of a glass, throw in hot water, in about three or four seconds you can turn it upside down, it's all gel. So this now, we have now taken earth technology, <coughs> taken it back to space. Okay. Uh, well, you don't wear it that you don't wear it that long, but yes. But uh, okay. Uh, what about taking a shower in space? Okay, there we built it. If you go down the shower, if you go down the sky uh, to the uh, space museum in uh, Washington City, you will see a shower. We did. We took that urine separator there and put it into a shower separator. We actually could have water squirted on your body, and we had a, like a like a like a hula hoop uh, tunnel. You pull it up from the floor, the deck and you put it around your body and you squirt water down your body and you do a shower, okay? Now, the Russians, when they built the mirror, they physically built a clone of this. Here's two Russians cosmos taking a shower on the mirror. Okay, there's their, there's their system. They actually built a system pretty close to ours. However, there is a, a situation, okay, now, if you squirt water in your body in space and you physically don't move, the water, the surface tension takes over. You can't really uh, see that, but I got a bubble of water on my skin right there, kind of like undulating around. It's sticky. It sticks to you in space. Along comes gravity, and it runs down the drain. So when you take a shower at home, you know, it's naturally in space. You can physically, if you don't move, excuse me, wine, good wine, California wine. Uh, <laughs> you can physically squirt water over your whole body and encase your whole body in a bubble of water and breathe through a straw. Now, you, can't, you don't conceive of that because you're not in zero gravity mode. And with your longer hair, you can put about two or three liters of water in the length of your hair. They could call you a big waterhead. Now, if you shook your body like Rover, where's that water going to go? Inside that shower stall, ricochet back and forth, and you've got to breathe. You may ingest some of your own bath water. You want to do that? So now the Russians, they solved that problem. What they did is they put, if you notice in the, in the cosmonaut's mouth, he's got a little a scuba gear mouthpiece. So he's breathing through a hose to the outside of the cabin. However, after a year and a half, they threw that thing away. It took eight hours for two cosmos to take a shower in space. So it was a matter of uh, time. But they had a, you know, it's, you got to heat up the water. You got to, you know, in fact, on the sky lab, we only gave them six pounds of hot, of medium warm water to, to do a shower in the sky on the sky lab. Okay. Now, urinal. Ah, here's the urine hose. Okay. I didn't go through that, but basically, again, we use. The urine separator, and if you have ever seen the uh, Space Cowboys movie, that's it right there, okay? One size fits all, okay? However, uh, you have a very gentle, gentle airflow. You kind of take your, per this, is your this is the only difference between male and female. You take your personal funnel, this is you put in your ditty bag. You take it out, you scoot into a little uh, receptacle here and position in front of you. Now, also, you can simultaneously urinate and defecate if you want to. Or you ladies, you can take, this is, your, this is uh, your little funnel. You screw that in here. And now even you ladies can stand up for your rights. Okay. <laughs> so that's uh, okay. We're um, we're kind of like I can talk about. I think we're pretty close. And I like to open up the question. I hope you had a good time. I can talk about Mars a little bit, or we can talk about anything. But any any good questions? Can I ask you a question? You got a pet cat at home? Who's got Who's got a pet cat? You got a pet cat? What's the name of your cat? Sister, if you're going to Mars, could you build a spacesuit for if you're a technician uh, to go to Mars with your pet cat? A little spacesuit, little ears here, and a little. You probably, you probably, yeah, you, you. But where would you put the space kitty litter? See the problems you got to worry about? Okay, are you a baseball player? Yeah. What's the size of a baseball field on Mars? Ooh, that's a big question. Okay, stump your teacher tomorrow. Okay, now, if you wanted the same same uh, amount of home runs. 
You would, what's, what caused the baseball to come down on Earth? Gravity. What caused the baseball to come down on Mars? Gravity. And most kids don't, and they're not, it's going to fly forever. No. There's, if you weigh 100 pounds on Earth, you weigh 38 pounds on, on Mars. So therefore, you need the home run fence about three times further out. Okay, could you throw a curveball on Mars? You're a good pitcher, right? That thing goes shh, shh. Could you throw a curveball on Mars? Before you say yes or no, I'm an engineer. What are the facts? What, see, what causes the curveball to curve on Earth? The spin of the ball and the density of the air. Okay, is there, is there air? Can you spin a ball on Mars? Yeah, you probably could. Is there air on Mars? Yes, there is. It's about one hundredth. Uh, air on, Mar on Earth is 760 millimeters of mercury. That's 760 millimeters of mercury, roughly about. That's about six millimeters of mercury. One hundredth. So you need a ball a hundred times bigger to get the same spin or the same curve. So, the, so we got now the idea. The atmosphere on Mars is one hundredth of Earth. Is there leap year on Mars? Oh, and stump your, stump your, uh, stump your husband. Is there a leap year on Mars? What again? What is leap year on Earth? It's a time correction factor for the spin around the sun. So theoretically, there could be leap year on Mars. Yes, you had your question. Sorry. Okay. Okay. If you got, I'll try to go through it fast. Number one, you grow an inch and a half taller. When as soon as you get your your body right now is compressed by gravity, so most of it in your spine. Okay. So you roughly go a green shaft taller. But when you come back from space, you go back to the same amount. So any basketball players, you know, basketball is not, not a fun game in space anyway. Number two, you have a, immediately when they have MECO, main engine cut off, you get a fluid shift. You're kind of like dumped into zero gravity, OK? If you, anybody here do gymnastics? You ever stand on your head? Go home tonight and stand on your head, OK? P poke yourself, pop yourself up in the corner of a room, and you will feel a fluid shift to your head. I used to do gymnastics back in the University of Wisconsin. And you could feel that. Very, the cheeks would pop out. The astronauts feel they thought At first, on the, on the Mercury days, they thought they had a, like getting a sinus problem. But it was nothing more than a fluid shift. Now, if you're dumb enough to stand on your head for three days, your body will say, something's wrong here. You will acclimate to space. You will basically now start to fluid, shift the fluid back to a normal position. Hence, you come back from space. Now you have a fluid shift to the lower part of your body. Now, these are basically bloods and signs and everything else. But now, you get that lightheaded feeling. And the astronauts coming back on the, on the, sh on the shuttle, two of them are the pilot and commander. They want to be pretty, but pretty alert to fly the thing back sometimes. So they worry about that. There are countermeasures for that. You get a fluid loss. You get a, sorry, a bone loss density. OK, you, uh, you also have uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, fluid space sickness. The astronauts may have, did the astronauts talk about this when they were here? What happens is, there is no zero gravity training chamber. So you are not, you never, even though if you're a pilot, can stand six or seven Gs. When you go in, that's, that's a sustained G force on against your sensory systems. In space, you have zero gravity. Your inner ear gets confused because you get, and all of a sudden your follicles tend to kind of flop around a little bit. And if you move your head too fast in relation to your other sensory perception, which is your eyes, you could have projectile vomiting immediately. It's like being on a carnival ride. So now here's a situation. We don't let the astronauts go in the spacesuit for the first three or four days because, again, you get acclimated to that. Uh, there is, um, there's a lot more subtle ones, but those are the main ones, OK? Uh, those are some of the things we found out. And there's, we found out on the, on the Skylab days that your body chemistry with all the urine samples tend to kind of like fluctuate and after 20-some days tend to kind of even out just the reclamation, you know, kind of acclimation to space. Okay, any, uh, any more questions? Pre uh, yes, back there. Uh, the only, the only uh, from an engineering point of view, the only thing I know, when we put this Skylab up, because this, uh, of the 11-year the change in solar, if you want to call it the, the solar uh, cycle kind of, that the atmosphere expanded slightly. And the, therefore, the, the Skylab started to uh, hit more atmosphere and slow down faster and came back in over. In fact, that's why when they came over Australia, they had a thousand urine bags full of urine coming down over Australia. Uh, but I don't know of, of any details to your question. Okay? But right now, like on the, on this, on the, sh on the uh, 
on the uh, Mars. All I'm trying to say is now we can take CO2. We have a chemical process that we kind of, that was the Sabatier, CO2 reduction process. We use that to, to be able to take carbon dioxide, potential atmosphere on Mars, mix it with some hydrogen that you take up, you put it into a presence of a catalyst, ruthenium, a rare earth metal, and jump start it, you'll get a reaction, an exothermic reaction, 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and you'll get methane, CH4, and water, okay? Now you get the fuel to get back from Mars, then you take water by electrolysis, and you break it down to hydrogen and oxygen. You put the hydrogen back into the other system. Now, why am I going through that? That's for Mars. But all I'm trying to say is that if you could take, like, global warming, if that's an issue, if you can concentrate CO2 in some of your situations, take this, like California cleaned up their emissions with the, with the catalyst quite a bit in the cars. If you can do that on smokestacks, maybe you can clean up some of the emissions of CO2. That technology right now is sitting on a shelf collecting dust. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, I don't know the total answer. Yes. Oh, sorry. A lot. You may have heard. You may have heard of the when the time when their progress vessel crashed into their solar panels, and they said, "Oh, gee whiz, they're they're all they're they're, they're total deadbeats doing this kind of stuff." When reverse engineering the Russian spacesuit, it's like if you like if you're a Ford or a Chevy person, their spacesuit was a little bit lighter. They had some more, they had a few safety issues we didn't care about, but it basically uh, they can get in their suit uh, about in a one minute situation. We can get in our suit in about a half an hour, okay? Uh, their water system, very interesting. They design to cultural differences. Uh, we, I, don't, I don't have time to show it, but we have a complicated water. We have just developed, sent to NASA, our water reclamation system for the space, space station. We can take all the hygiene water, we claim it back to reusable drinkable water uh, uh, continuously, okay? But kind of batch out operation. But, we have a nice system where chill the astronauts wanted chilled water, just like everybody here has nice chilled water, right? Because that's our culture. Well, that takes energy to chill it down to 40 degrees. The Russians, what's their favorite drink? Hot tea. Hot, well, hot, well, that's another story. <laughs> another story. I can, that's another culture. But basically, they have a pasteurizer at 180 degrees that takes care of some of the bacteria, okay? They t their main water output is from the pasteurizer and they want hot tea. Now, vodka. They, they, well, I had a chance to deal with some of the Russians. Uh, Mr. Rudy, I don't care. Anyway, basically, I had so much vodka to drink, I don't think I could survive even this tour here. But basically, they require vodka on board. They verify they had vodka on board. Now, on Skylab, remember I talked about taking blood samples? We can take blood samples. So you take a little a alcohol wipes out, sterilize your skin, where would the alcohol vapor evaporate in the cabin, and get back in the water system, and you couldn't get it out. So NASA said, you can't use alcohol. So when we designed the alcohol, the system for the, for the space station originally, NASA said, don't worry about alcohol. We'll change it to maybe hydrogen peroxide or something like that. Anyway, along come the Russians. Oh, we got vodka on board. We ran their system. We verified we'd take out trace contamination of vodka. Yes. Because of a cultural requirement to have their drink on board. Very, their hardware was very robust. And also, I was talking to somebody else here. I can't remember who. But we found out on the urine system, our system there was made out of stainless steel, very heavy. Their urine, in fact, for our space station urine system uh, has to be made out of titanium. They use a lot of titanium, very robust hardware. However, they don't have the microprocessors like we do. So most of their control boxes, uh, they had them all sealed up with wax, and on that little, so I couldn't take the seals off, so I x-rayed them. But inside was a whole bunch of Potter and Blumfield uh, mechanical relays, little electrical relay. You turn it on, click, 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 and the thing would start up. So we'd have a microprocessor, or a solid state relay. Uh, yes, you had a, uh, so yes, there are differences. Yes, you had a quick final. Yeah, there's, uh, <coughs> there's a sense of change as opposed to the, uh, uh, Some astronauts say taste changes, and I got some space food up here. They don't eat, uh, you got some uh, Gemini food out here, but now they eat shrimp cocktail. Some people say there's a taste change. I don't. Uh, some people, some astronauts say no. You got to talk to them. It's not. It's not this. I'm not. They have not made it an issue. Number one, and most of their food now is pretty good. They take up. Uh, don't take up Dunkin' Donuts in space because you get crumbs all over the place. <laughs> and don't take up carbonated uh, soft drinks like Co Coke and Pepsi. I told you, they did have a problem with uh, basically Coke and Pepsi in space because if you got a burp in space, the bubble of gas is not at the top of your stomach. It's right in the middle. It expands, and the Coke and Pepsi comes up, and it don't taste so good the second time around. 
Uh, yes, uh, I f I'll be around a while. Yes, I think uh, for those of you that like to stick around, I think you can probably talk to Dr. Flush, uh, excuse me, Mr. Rusty. Oh, well, whatever. I'm sticking around to answer a few questions, but I wanted to thank you very much for uh, giving us probably what is the most enlightening uh, lecture on space flight that we've ever had. Oh, well, all right. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. Stay there, just a minute. Uh, I want to give you something, okay? okay. This, oh, yeah, are you there? Oh. Okay, well, any more? Yes, uh, and uh, <laughs> this is a sort of a memento. Oh. Uh, since we have uh, uh, gotten the loan of the Apollo 9 command module, we have for you a uh, picture of Space Pen engraved with uh, the San Diego Aerospace Museum Apollo 9 has landed um, logo. Oh. For you to use once I'll you find yourself in a microgravity situation, you're doing the right. Oh. I'll be deeply, this, uh, thank you very much for this, Bruce. Thank really. You very much. And tell you what. I, because of this and because you got me out here, I'm going to give you something now. <laughs> okay. Now, you can, don't, uh, don't worry. This is okay. Don't bother. <laughs> the, uh, on, on the, on the uh, present space suits is the patch designed by one of our, our, our medical doctor at Hamilton. This is the patch that's on the space suits. That don't, we can't put a Hamilton standards name on it because we're sold and we sell them to NASA. And they, you know, give us a little money, but that's okay. <laughs> but basically, uh, this is a patch, okay? That you, you could use that. In, uh, Thank you very much. And that's the dimensions of man, basically, uh, for the shuttle pad. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you once again. Uh, Why would I imply that the estimates that were on the challenger were analyzed? That's the first time I've ever heard I that the astronauts were even found. They were found. They were found. Yes, sir. I had a personal interview with the medical doctor in charge of that discussion, that, uh, that analysis. And we also, before that, we knew, because we built the life support, so we knew that they already turned over two of the astronauts to the manual valve. <laughs> that was early in the process. but. The final analysis, they found they found all of their bodies. They found most Together, of the equipment. Not, not to, the capsule, when it hit the water, disintegrated. They were, the, the capsule was relatively intact, but, but it was, uh, what am I call it, compromised. Because the pipes and wires and the, uh, were coming out of the explosion, if you look at the shuttle, that bulkhead right in back of the cabin is a pressurized bulkhead. Right in back of that is a weak point. So that point severed either not perfectly, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. and anyway, they, they, I bet you, and I, I, this I can't verify, but I bet you that the capsule was partially, the cabin lost its pressure within, within immediately. Because remember, yeah, yeah, sure. remember the pilot was flying this golf, uh, this golfer, he was flying a golf airplane, yeah. and he, he got up to an altitude, and all of a sudden they had immediate cabin pressure, and they were flying, and they went on autopilot, and they were both unconscious. Yeah. Until back, oh, you know, same thing. Well, within, 15, you know, within 15 seconds, you're basically unconscious. Now that the two, the commander and pilot on board the right in the, sh in the cockpit, yeah. they on the Challenger, they got most of the they got most of the training, they got all the equipment right there. They can change over. The astronauts that are in the mid deck down below, they're probably sitting too far away from that stuff. They didn't have that opportunity. However, they figure they were either conscious or they were mostly semi, uh, either semi-conscious or unconscious in this scenario. So when they hit the water, they didn't they didn't know it yeah. by definition. But their cause of death was blunt trauma when they hit the water. At blunt that point in time, blunt trauma? blunt trauma means impact, oh. by definition. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Acceleration. Immediate. You know, like you hit, you hit the water. You're probably your terminal velocity is much higher than a free fall of, an, yeah, yeah, of a skydiver. Yeah. So when they hit the, the when they found the cabin parts, they were relatively in one area, but they were basically in pieces mm -hmm. because of the hit of the water. Okay, uh, that I'm uh, at this point it is it is a fact. Okay. So they did find the bodies. They did find the bodies. Yes, the they bodies they did our they found the bodies on the uh, on the ch on the on the Columbia also. That's what I understand. That's yes, sir. In some place, right? Yes, sir. But uh, have you met the uh, Israelis that were on that flight? 
No, I have not. Oh, history. I, I, history. I, pilot history. I, I, I don't know all the history, but the we, we, we on the on the Columbia. Yeah. Well, good. Uh, no, we have had some great speeches, and all of them were interesting. Yours was equally interesting, but yours was by far the most. Thanks a lot. Well, well, thank, thank you. I, pr I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, I, I, I did. Take, take some handouts over there if you want to. I'll sign them for your grandkids or whatever else, and uh, okay. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a nuts and bolts, different type of humorous uh, type of talk. Okay. And I'm not the user. I'm the we design the stuff, so that's why we're intimate with it. Yes. With the nuts and bolts part, a lot of times, and we do have quite a few astronauts and pilots, but a lot of times we're expecting the technical, yeah. and they're more philosophical. Yeah. And, and I'm like, wait, I want to know what happened. Did, did I give I you enough information? Oh, I loved it. I loved okay. it. I came, you sat to him, my son and I sat down. Well, I, I was a little bit worried about some of the jokes. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs>